What's up, everyone? Pags here at MEI Studio. This week, we're not looking at a particular microphone, but instead, we're going on a journey to understand phantom power, trying to debunk a few myths along the way, or blow up a ribbon or dynamic mic. It's all about phantom power, this time on the Mic Locker. The idea of being able to power devices remotely is not a new one. Nikola Tesla attempted to make powering all things in the home using remote wireless power just a few minutes away from the studio here on Long Island, New York. In the studio, where we have all sorts of cables everywhere for everything, applying power to a microphone that needs it, well, wasn't always at the push of a button. Early tube microphones required sometimes more than 100 volts for operation, along with other voltages to heat the tube up. Since there were multiple voltages at play along with an audio signal and a ground, we would see cables either 5 or 7 pin typically, with some others having even more. The idea was that each conductor or pin would carry its own voltage to where it needed to go, so to power these mics we had bulky boxes. The mics would plug into that, had some hefty transformers and large capacitors that would need to be plugged into the wall, somewhat close to the microphone itself. The mic connecting cable, the one with the lot of pins, would go between this power supply and the mic, and then another, usually balanced three-pin cable, would then connect from the power supply to the microphone preamp or console. And this is the way condenser mics rolled for many years. As the transistor came into play and manufacturers started using these new solid state components, the need for a big power box was reduced and replaced by smaller boxes which produced the lower voltages needed to polarize the capsule and provide voltage to the transistors. Something called T-powering was developed where power was run up the mic's audio cable. This power was met by some capacitors that were in the mic that would block the DC voltage from traveling further into the audio path. However, the audio would have to travel through these caps as well and back down to the preamp. This was a less than ideal situation as it made the microphones noisier than they needed to be. This method was used for many years in the film industry, even after the advent of modern phantom power as we know it. Video guys being video guys, just ignoring audio quality, as usual. In the mid-60s, Sheps worked out a way to send power up the audio cable that did not cause this noise, and shortly after, Neumann pushed the standard of 48 volts to be used for this method. Since the new mics like the U87 and Shep's CMT line needed a stable voltage source, and consoles and mic pre's of the time didn't have phantom power built into their circuitry, we were still stuck with these little boxes to supply the mics with power. Neumann allowed users to either use one of these breakout boxes or a battery in the mic itself, which is why vintage U87s have that battery compartment. Do you ever notice that? Eventually, manufacturers began to implement phantom power into their preamp and console designs so that power could be applied from the desk. And it's here that all sorts of stories arose of catastrophic calamities of running that newfangled phantom power through the mic lines, destroying microphones and wreaking havoc. Darn clouds, I know you're up to no good. Anyway. Let's be clear, they weren't just stories, and they were true, and that was a long time ago when standards were either not a thing or loosely implemented at best. We've all heard that you shouldn't put phantom power on a ribbon mic because it'll burn the ribbon up, or we shouldn't put phantom power on dynamic mics because it'll damage the capsule. While that was pretty sound advice back in 1966, things are a bit different now. Or are they? We're going to have a bit of an electronics lesson before we get into the real-life test examples. I'll try to keep things as simple as possible, but just knowing how these concepts work will save you some time, trouble, and possibly some money down the road. Let's do it. Electricity runs in a circuit from a source to a ground, or what's called a potential difference. And that's just fancy speak to talk about a difference between two different voltages. When it comes to the actual electricity, let's think of it like this. How much electricity that you're using is the voltage, and how fast the electricity is moving is the current, or amperage. 
If the current is allowed to flow unchecked, we either pop a fuse or have a fire as electrons are flowing through the component or wires so fast they create an immense amount of heat. The simulation that we're going to use actually won't even allow you to run voltage right to ground because, well, we just don't do that. It's dangerous and you can just ask Medi over at the Electroboom channel all about that. A resistor limits the amount of current that can go through a path. It can do other things as well, but let's keep it simple for now. The energy buildup is converted into heat, which is why for certain applications we can see these little quarter watt resistors and in others, something a little bigger. So in a phantom power circuit, we have a voltage source, which is 48 volts usually from our power supply. A standard of sorts was set that says you should be able to provide at least 10 milliamps. So we need to do that at least to meet that standard. And to do that, we need to do some math in the background. And we come up with a resistor value of 6.81 kilo ohms, or 6810 ohms. With a supply of 48 volts, this gives us around seven milliamps of current on each leg. Seven times two is 14 milliamps. So 14 is bigger than 10, so that's enough to meet the need with some wriggle room. This is what most preamps that we see today use. A side note here, when building a phantom power circuit, it's really important to make sure that the resistors are as close as possible to being the same value. All resistors have what's called a tolerance, which is how off the resistor is allowed to be. Some old carbon comp resistors can have a tolerance of 20%. That's a pretty big swing, especially when we start to get into higher value resistors. That's the potential swing of anywhere between 800 and 1200 ohms for a resistor that's valued at 1000 ohms. It's not so great. And this is also why analog gear sounds slightly different from unit to unit. Tolerances. Newer film resistors can have a way tighter tolerance of down to 0.1% and possibly even less. These are usually what we go for in this situation. So in order to make sure we don't have an imbalance between the hot and the cold pins, we use the closest matching pair of resistors we can get, and that's it on the power supply side. Now, what's going on inside the mic when we plug it in? Well, in most cases, nothing. Without a connection to ground, we have no current. The voltage is balanced between the pins and in a state of equilibrium. Problems occur when we have a bad cable or the pins of the cable don't all connect at the same time. In cases where mic lines between rooms are run through patch bays, like here, Bantam or TRS connections can make connection to ground and hot pins at the same time while plugging or unplugging the cable. This is known as hot plugging, and this is something you want to avoid for both the mic and the preamp sake. Here we have a circuit simulation of a phantom supply. If we touch one of the sides to ground, we get an instant flow of electrons. But for now, let's assume that all is right with the world, our cables are working perfectly, we're not hot plugging anything, and we have a mic pre with phantom power engaged. We plug in the cable and engage phantom power. And we get nothing. Okay, now let's assume that all isn't right with the world and one of the cable pins is broken. What happens? Nothing. Okay, now let's pretend that one of our pins has made a ground connection. We have a bad cable or something. Here we have a bit of an issue. Now we have voltage that's zipping through the transformer in our mic and we're causing what's called a magnetization current. Big word time. This is when we have voltage flying around one side of a transformer. This is going to cause the transformer to heat up and we can potentially damage this transformer if left unchecked. We can see that the transformer stops voltage from passing through to the mic circuit. Transformers block DC voltage. A transformer only works with AC, not DC. And phantom power is DC, direct current. It's 48 volts DC. So the transformer keeps our mic element safe here. What if our mic doesn't have a transformer? Well, similar to that T-power thing we talked about earlier, capacitors or diodes can be used to block the DC from entering this circuit. Uh, this implementation, though, isn't as noisy as the old T-power way of doing things. So if properly implemented, this too will stop DC from getting to our mic element. 
So now, if the transformer is stopping the voltage from cooking our capsule, how is applying phantom power going to destroy the mic? The short answer is, it's not. The whole phantom power on a ribbon or dynamic mic thing is largely inapplicable in this day and age with modern equipment. Back when we had unbalanced microphones wired to look like balance mics, a mistake could be made applying phantom power to an unbalanced line and yeah, there were problems. In this case, we would have phantom power coming in on pin 2 and pin 3 of the XLR, but in some unbalanced connections, phantom power would then be connected to ground. And that's a problem as we just saw. Another issue we had, particularly with older ribbon mics, is the transformer in the mic had what's called a center tap, which is an extra output kind of on the transformer that some manufacturers tie to ground. Applying phantom power to these mics for an extended period of time could certainly cause some issues. In some cases, the mic can be modded to remove the center tap from ground. Some claim this changes the sound of the microphone, but that's another test for another time. So bottom line, if you have an old ribbon mic, you might want to avoid putting phantom power through the line. Newer mics, unless they're exact clones of some old 1930s style mics, they still probably don't have that center tap, but either way, it's probably a good idea to avoid putting phantom power through it. But what happens if we do? Does the ribbon burn up as some claim? Does it just tear itself from the tension clips? Does it open a rift in the space-time continuum, sucking the mic in like a black hole? Let's find out. We set up an experiment with a homemade ribbon motor. Even this crude 3D printed monstrosity actually works and doesn't sound horrible. So I just wanted to prove that this monstrosity here actually does pass audio and you can definitely hear my voice through it and it's clear. Uh, it does have a little bit of hum and buzz and stuff because there's no shielding around it and I left the transformer hanging out. Why ribbon mics are so expensive, I still can't figure out. Anywho, we're going to apply phantom power from this broken down old mic pre, provided the phantom power still works. It does. We're going to put the camera on the mic element when we engage phantom power so you can see what happens. We're then going to use a TRS barrel connector to simulate hot plugging. Here we see the mic ribbon jiggle a little bit when we engage phantom power, and this is because nothing is truly exact with resistance, and phantom power entering the transformer causes a quick change in the core of the transformer for an instant, and then it balances itself out. In, out. But how bad is this? If done repeatedly, this jolt could cause an overly tensioned ribbon to tear, but where's the fire? Spoiler alert, we're not going to see any. Sorry. The danger here is the same as if we placed a ribbon mic in front of the port on a kick drum. Probably shouldn't do that if you want to keep the ribbon healthy. The ribbons in these mics are normally corrugated, which means it has this zigzag shape on it which is done to help work harden the ribbon material as well as make it more springy to react to incoming sound. The corrugation also helps to mitigate movements like this from destroying the ribbon. I couldn't be bothered to crimp this before I put it in the mic, so this is pretty close to as bad as a situation to begin with as you can get. The ribbon, however, isn't pulled very tight, so we're kind of saved from the ripping and the tearing. If a ribbon mic is excessively cold, like if you were transporting it in the middle of winter without protection, the ribbon may be a little tense. You know, shrinkage? It's a good idea to let the mic acclimate to the room before using it anyway. Condensation is never a good thing with audio equipment in any situation. Applying phantom power to a mic in this state might be enough to tear the ribbon. So. Are all the cautionary tales true or false? To me, seeing this, I do think that one should avoid applying phantom power to a ribbon mic if it can be avoided. If it's unavoidable, make sure your cables are good and the mics don't have center tap transformers. Applying phantom may help to stretch out the ribbon over time, but generally, it's not going to destroy your mic. And now what about dynamic mics? Well, the same things apply. After all, ribbon mics technically are dynamic mics. One difference, though, is that many dynamic mics 
don't have a transformer or other support circuitry to block DC voltage from coming in. So what happens? Again, as long as the cables are good and the phantom power between pins is nice and even, we don't have an issue since we're in a state of equilibrium with the voltages just sitting across the pins, and thus the capsule. One popular pair of dynamic mics that don't have transformers are the Sennheiser E609 and E906. XLR connector straight to the capsule. So let's see what happens when we hot plug. Hot plug. In three, two, one. Again, we have a short burst of motion, then equilibrium. Like the ribbon mic, over time this could cause problems with the mic if you keep doing this, so maybe don't do that. But it wasn't enough to destroy the mic, and what really happened here is just like a strong sound pressure wave hitting the mic. Same thing as the ribbon. Now, last scenario. Probably never going to happen in a studio, but let's see what it is. What if we have an unbalanced mic with no transformer, meaning one side of the capsule will be getting phantom power and the other side goes to ground? Well, exactly what we would expect. The diaphragm pushes forward or backwards, depending on how the mic is wired. And this is like putting a 9 volt battery across speaker leads. After all, a dynamic mic is just a speaker in reverse. If we add direct current or DC to a speaker, it moves in only one direction and doesn't come back to zero. However, when we remove the voltage, the diaphragm goes back to normal. Even though the mic was maxed out, it still works. Again, not something you want to do very often. Sorry this video wasn't a fireworks show, but I hope that it kind of clears up what happens in these circumstances. While manufacturers use an abundance of caution when telling customers not to have phantom power engaged while using their ribbon or dynamic mics, it's not a scare tactic or to relieve themselves of any kind of liability if it happens. It's a precautionary thing because stuff happens. Things break and things go wrong. Just an hour before filming this video, I had a cable go bad in the studio. An installed cable that no one ever touches. So it's not like it broke, it just went bad. In the event that a solder joint lets go inside of a cable and a ground connection is made to one of the pins in your XLR cable, yeah, don't run phantom power unless you need to. By no means am I saying that it's okay to run phantom power on good lines with your dynamics and ribbons either. Follow the manufacturer's recommendations and you should be good to go. If you have an old vintage mic that might have a center tap, avoid phantom power at all costs. With most modern mics, if you make a mistake, you're probably going to be okay. Just correct the mistake as soon as possible. And it's still not a good idea to hot patch anything, as the mic is not the only thing exposed to that voltage. Dropping 48 volts in your patch bay can affect anything else that's plugged into the patch bay at the time, especially if the grounds are all shared or on a bus wire. Not good. Hopefully someone out there learned something new today. If you did, please consider hitting that subscribe button and the like button. It'll really help us out. If you have any questions about this video, please hit me up in the comments. If you have the winning Powerball numbers for the next draw, send me a message through the studio website. I definitely want to hear from you. Well, that's it for this time. Thanks for hanging out. This is Pags, signing off.